And I think it was even that moment we were like, we're only going to write breakdowns from now on. So this, it might've been before even sworn in it hit us properly because we've seen that and we're just like, fuck everything in the world. Let's write breakdowns. Hello everybody. And welcome to the 26th episode of the true shot guest spot. And as you can see, my guest today is one that I've been trying to get on the podcast for a little while, and we finally got it. This is Sabian Lynch, guitar player of Alpha Wolf. Sabian was a really cool guy. This interview, uh, or podcast, whatever you want to call it, is a little bit shorter than the ones I've been previously doing. I like to go long with the podcast. I think that's really, really the best way, it's kind of what I've decided on. But this one's about an hour because Sabian's in Australia, which is 16 hours ahead, so it's tough to, you know really have a four three hour podcast you know when it's 2 a.m where he is and 9 a.m where i am so we'll have a part two for sure but in this episode we kind of scratch the surface of the beginning stages of alpha wolf and just the sounds that influence alpha wolf and sabian we talk about both of our love for the band Amur. and uh yeah this was just really a kind of like a like you know just a, an introductory kind of show but i think for future ones when i have him back on again we'll dive into some more I guess personal topics, but anyways, here's my interview with Sabian Lynch of Alpha Wolf. Sabian Lynch, how are you? Dude, I'm good. It's what, 1.20 a.m. Melbourne time, and I'm still hyped. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. Long yeah. time coming, this one, isn't it? It is. It is. It's uh, It's funny, yeah. So uh, I know that you're 16 hours ahead over there in Melbourne, and uh, yeah, so it's 9.20 a.m. here. And uh, it's crazy, this time difference, man. Uh, I don't know. How, how is it even possible that a time zone can be 16 hours ahead? Do you know? It, it makes it hard, doesn't it? It, it does. It's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, have you experienced uh, some, like, I don't want to say annoying stuff that, uh, that has to do with that time difference. But, you know, I know that you're obviously on Sharp Tone and, you know, they're primarily American based. So have there been some things where you're like, oh, shit, I got to wake up at 3 a.m. for this or I got to, you know, stuff like that? Yeah, I guess I guess um, press time around that time is really weird. I do tell everyone to just hit me at midnight because that seems to work for everyone. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to urgencies and needing to contact Sharp Tone, it can be a tricky one, you know, because we like to push everything prime time, Melbourne time. Yeah, but that doesn't necessarily work for you guys, especially when it's like new song this Friday, but we drop it what Thursday afternoon for you guys. Yeah, normally exactly. Yeah, I know for for us when we released our song, I had people that for were from Melbourne and they were like, "The new song is sick," and I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's right. It, it's out yep, now. Yep. It's like four four days away." But yeah, it's already out because of Melbourne time. Yeah, no, it's fun. It's good. Yeah, but yeah, like uh, definitely when we try and contact Sharp Tone, I don't know for any random thing, if it needs to be done right now, it could, they could be sleeping for the next eight hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got to deal with it. It yeah. is what it is. Yeah. So speaking of Sharp Tone, now I, I, as you can see, I, I, I'm wearing an Alpha Wolf shirt because this is actually the first uh, 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 musician uh, slash band member that I've had on of merch that I own. So uh, you should. Oh, be very, oh yeah. Feel very honored. About Love it. to see it. Yeah, no, because you know what, man, I ain't one of these fake fans, okay? I, you know, because I've I see some interviews all the time with musicians where you know you can see that the interview is trying to be like a fan, and they get all kinds of information mixed up. I'm I'm a real fan, okay? So That's we, what we want. yeah, I go back to the mono days. Um, you would have bought that off our Australian merch store, yeah? This this shirt here, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So we still pack and send all of that. So Scotty would have handled that for you. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I love this shirt. The, I know people can't see the design on the back, but that's what really sold me on it. Um, but yeah, man, it was actually funny because like leading up to this interview, what you said has been kind of a long time coming. I've been harassing you and I know that I have been, but I've been trying to lightly harass you. So I hope I wasn't uh, too harassing. Nah, that's, that's sweet. That's sweet. It's just got to go through the right channels and be the right timing and everything like that. But, you know, everything slowed down for the most part in our camp and we got time. We got nothing but time Cool. So you hit me at the right moment. Yeah, no, and it's two days till my birthday. So what 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 a gift this is. You know what I mean? There you go. Happy birthday, my man. How old are you? <laughs> I'm gonna be twenty-eight and I feel oh, I have a I have a ten year old son, so I feel forty eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm about to turn thirty, man. I'm scared. 
Are you really? Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, because I was going to ask, because I know that Alf Wolf's been around for a minute. And I I mean, I go back to the mono days, but you guys even have material dating back, I think, to like, well, like 2012, 2013, right? Yeah, we we kind of erased everything that we released between 2012, 2014. It's all gone off the internet completely because 2015 is when we started like the evil, heavy breakdowns, the evil look the mask and stuff like that so that was the start of the alpha wolf that you know now before then we're finding our footing we um, we didn't know what we're doing we wanted to be pop punk we wanted to be like yordi myers we wanted to be the ghost inside (laughs) and we wanted to be a muir we wanted to be whatever and then sworn in came out we're like that's that's it. it That's it. Yeah, no, it's funny. Uh, so, 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 okay. So that's interesting. So somewhere in the annals of internet history, there is an Alf Wolf pop punk sounding band. Yep. 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 So um, <laughs> we might put it on our Patreon, some videos. I've oh, been man. finding old GoPro footage and stuff, you know, me wearing board shorts and doing punk jumps and oh my backwards God. caps and all that sort of, sort of stuff. But yeah, That'd be cool. we, had, we had like a 10 song set then. And it was like, Fuck, we even had some real lighter spewy type, real soft, no drum tracks. And oh my god, we were spitting out tracks after tracks, just trying to find what we wanted to sound like. And eventually, we're like, breakdowns, yeah. The bre- breakdowns, a break. Listen, man, I know that you said that you're turning 30, I'm 28. I don't know, I just it's one of those things. But I, when I was a kid, I always said, like, I'll always play video games, and now it's just you know, life, I just don't have a lot of time really anymore but i do play world of warcraft but anyways what i'm getting at is that it's like as i get older i'm like man i don't know if i'll ever not like breakdown based music i just love this straight up straight up like i can be stuck in my old ways and only like music that came out five ten years ago (laughs) but i'll you know there'll always be a heavy part in the song i'll be like you got me you've you fucking got me yeah, no, it's funny. I uh, I joke all the time with my with the the other guys in the band uh, because it they they seem to like well because we do like the reaction stuff like that. So we find other bands, but they uh, they seem to have like their core select few bands that they really like. And I always make the joke. It's like nothing beats the Stones, man. Like that's just how they are. You know, it's just like yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. that grouping. But um, but yeah, man. So. I, my days with Alpha Wolf, finding you guys, I was honestly trying to think back before this interview. I'm like, how the hell did I even discover you guys? Because, I mean, back then with Mono, you obviously weren't as popular as you are now. And I honestly think I found you guys through a reaction channel. I could be wrong, but oh, I, think, true. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think that's how I initially discovered you guys. I think they yeah. were very few and far between back then, but... um, It might have been Truant was one. Yeah. He, he like, started it from what I remember, and he done one for us that probably got more views than our actual video did. Yeah. And um, Galactic Criminal, is it? He done one as well. Galactic Criminal, yep. They probably both done Water Break, and we saw the views on them, and we're like, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no. So I, I remember that sound. I remember like uh, I think my my track back then was uh, 104. I really gravitated yeah, yeah. towards that one. That one was fun. Um, and I, I heard that that's like a, a reference to uh, Cubone from Pokemon. Is yeah, that true? That's it. That's it. I remember I was talking to a friend and I was like, look, man, I really want to reference Cubone like, <laughs> in the song and in the song title. And he's just like, dude, the Pokedex number. And I was like, man, yes. Yeah, that's. I think that's awesome. Because what is it now? It's like with Cubone, it's like he wears the skull of his deceased mother or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, no. And, I think um, cool. even we hid the name Cubone in the lyrics. I made up the random line that says "Jump the lonely Q, bones hard to find." Like it makes no sense, but when you say it, "Jump the lonely Q, bones hard to find." So it's just a play on words where you say Cubone without. Like me Without saying it, I like that. Yeah. That's cool. but it makes no sense whatsoever. As yeah, a lyric. I I like that. That's a that's a cool little uh, homage there. But uh, yeah, so it sounds like um, from what from from my understanding, uh, I don't know if it's like this currently uh, with you guys, but it sounded like back then for Mono. Did you write pretty much all those lyrics for for that record? Um, I guess at the time, me and Scotty and the band were writing. Mm-hmm for the album and it was my first time wanting to write lyrics because I'd gone through some shit the year prior Mm. and so I was writing a bunch but I was pretty bad at lyrics because I'd never done it before and then 
when old mate joined the band, he was like this lyrical genius or whatever. And he helped out. He, I, he took on board all of my like ideas, all of the shit I wanted to touch on and bought in his own stuff or his own material. And we just worked on it together to create the 12 tracks. I think it was 12, 13 that were mono. So it's a bit of column A, column B. Um, I think all of the song titles were there before he came into the band and a lot of the themes. Mm-hmm. Um, some probably only had like one line written for it. Like I think it was number two. I was like, you know what? I want the second song in the album to be called number two and I want it to be about being second best. So it's like two, two, two. I only had one line written, but he's like, yeah, second best. Fuck yeah, let's go. Whereas other songs like 104, there was, you know, a whole fucking song written ready to go. Oh man, that's so funny. That's so ironic that you say that with the two, 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 because uh, my girlfriend, she... um she has a, a friend who, uh, you know, took his own life a few years ago, and that was his favorite number, two, two, two. So that's just very oh, ironic. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, have to, I'll have to tell her about that. She'll be like, "See, it's popping up everywhere." But yeah, uh, it's just all this um like random stuff we wanted yeah. to um put on the album. You know, quirky song titles that just play off wherever they are placed on the album and the themes of the songs. And you always want a catchy song title. We we clicked onto that with Nailbiter. I couldn't find a song in the world called Nail Bar. And I was like, what? It rolls off the tongue. Well, you, you give it the scream test. We always give it a scream test um, before committing to a song title. Oh, it has to be it. like, yo, this song is called Nail Bar. Get the fuck up. <laughs> and if it doesn't sound cool like that, it can't be the song title. So Nail Bar just popped as a song title. And from then we're like, all right, every single song title needs to go through the scream test it needs to be catchy and for the most part it can't be already taken somewhere by another band you can't always be original with song titles because you just end up being too weird and too far-fetched but for the most part it, yeah you got to go through all the steps to find the best song titles for the songs yeah and i, I think that another band that really models after that is a band that i also really like and that i know that you are also a fan of is a mirror they kept maybe yeah. pick just some like like gypsy disco, just like some I love really it. I love cool. It. So I'm like, where the frig did this come from? I, Except I love- the old stuff that's like full sentences. I can't yeah. remember any of the fucking song titles. Yeah, like there's I, Telly. Like, what the hell is that again? I thought you met Telly Caspar. Imagine, something. yeah, imagine saying that like in a like you said in a screen voice. This song is called. I thought you meant Telly. You turn me into like it's just like a yeah, yeah, yeah. paragraph long, but. No, nah, man. So, yeah, I discovered you guys through Mono, and um, I know that you put that out through Grayscale, if I yep. recall correctly. And um, so when you guys, uh, after, you know, spending all those years trying to develop your sound, and then I know that you put out, I think it's like an EP with like, it looks like a Zeus-looking figure yep. on, the, on the cover. Um, what did you notice uh, happened with you guys in terms of, obviously, I know that, you know, we'll get to a quiet place to die, uh, where you guys have really started to take off, but with mono, what kind? What was like? Um, I don't know. I, I guess like you were like kind of defined it as successful. Like what was like the, yeah. like the mo- you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it was weird. So obviously we had the first two EPs. One was like five track, and one was a two track. And right. we kind of only wanted the music at the time, so we could hit the road and have fun with each other, like touring. Mm-hmm. Um, we're playing to empty rooms. <laughs> and I, w- I was booking the tours myself just so we could go out and tour. And I was booking these ridiculous tours. Like one was called the Anime Titties Tour. <laughs> and we, we were just doing that for the fun of it. Like we didn't see this business model or success out, out of it. We just wanted to have fun and tour. Um, it wasn't until we released Nailbiter and played the release shows for that, that we had 50 people singing along. Like the line in the middle that I want to, uh, I want to die here, can't you tell? all of a sudden we don't sing that line live. We let the crowd sing it and we're like, well, um, that's kind of cool. That feels good. Uh, so that in itself felt successful and that was before a label. So then we done the album, shopped around the local labels and got told no by everyone. Interesting. But then a local radio presenter that does all the metal here, I showed him the album because he's a friend of mine and he's like, are you guys getting signed? I was like, nah, man, no one wants it. And he's like, nah, it's bullshit. Give me a minute. And then within five minutes, we had a record contract from Grayscale. After that, I already said no. So he's just like, you guys are dumb if you don't sign this. It's sick. 
Interesting. How did you guys feel about that after they had said no to you, but then you kind of got, you know, kind of like a backdoor deal in a, in a, in a yeah, sense. It was weird. Like Grayscale was two guys. Well, it's three guys now, but originally it was two guys, Ash and Josh. Mm-hmm. So Josh, he's all, he loves his pop punk and stuff like that and not really breakdown. So they already had a breakdown band on the label and they thought that was enough. Um, but Ash was into it, but it was only half of the guys that wanted it. So only one guy that need, needed convincing. And we still let him know to this day, like, ah, you didn't even want us, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, as you said, like feeling to su- the success with Mono, it was cool. We Nailbiter definitely took us to the next step and people were excited and eager for the new songs. Mm. And it, I, I think we've chatted about this. We put out the strength of a full album start to finish yeah. and it gave something to indulge for like half an hour. Most people were like, well, oh, our fool for doing an album, like what the fuck? Aren't they that real shit band that only play breakdowns? <laughs> How can they put out a full album and then everyone listen to it and they're like, it's kind of cool. Uh, fucking our fools wrote a cool album, that's fucking good on them. So from that, we got cool tours and stuff like that, and it just lifted us like we never saw coming. And from that, it's just been a constant rise. It's interesting that you say that because I actually recently did a podcast with this uh, this gentleman, uh, Jeff Menick, who actually used to um, manage Sworn In during the Death Con. Yeah, I listened to that one. Oh, did you? Yeah, he. Yep, yep. he it was uh, it was cool, man. Because it's it's kind of funny. Not that I'm saying that you guys. I know that you're obviously very heavily influenced by Sworn In, and yeah, I know yeah. that everybody makes a joke like, "Man, if not for Sworn In, Australia would never have a music scene." You know, I know yeah, that's kind of yeah. a running joke, but um, it's kind of funny how you guys seem to kind of have a sort of paralleled uh, uh, stardom, so to speak, where it's like nobody wanted it. They're like, what the hell is this stuff? And then you guys did get eventually get signed. And it's funny because Grayscale now, at least from the American point of view, or at least from my point of view anyway, I think of Grayscale as like the premier heavy label in Australia now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they've got plenty of great bands. It's funny that you mentioned Swan In. We met up with those guys when they toured Australia. Oh, cool. And was was hanging around with them. And it was funny chatting with Chris, the drummer and songwriter. He's like, you guys put out the album that we probably should have. And it's cool to see our original sound just is still relevant today. Yeah, it's, uh, I gotta be honest, man. I, I like, so I love the death card. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, but I gotta be honest, the stuff after that, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know what happened. And I talked to Jeff about that. He was just like, he said that basically that he thought that they were kind of like running away from themselves. And that's unfortunate because I wish they yeah. had braced that sound because they did that so well. They really did. Yeah. I don't know. That whole scene did it real well. I, like, I remember around that time that we sweated Sworn In. It was Sworn In, Barrier, Villains, Youth Forever, um, Gift Giver, oh, he Kingmaker. Managed all those, he managed all those yeah. bands. That's crazy. And we were just like, that whole group of American bands is insane. And I feel like we nearly bought that whole essence into Australia with all of our breakdown bands now. We've just got this mad posse that you guys are jealous of. Yeah, and say on your tours and stuff like that. It's it's true, man. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Like whenever we hear a band over here nowadays, um, that's like heavy and you know down tune and breakdown. Uh, I like it's like the first band that comes to mind is like it's like an Alpha Wolf. It's like you know what I mean. It's like that's yeah. just kind of like it's just like that's the comparison nowadays, dude. Uh, it blows our mind that people like our band. Like there's people that like our band that have never heard Sworn In, and we're like, bro. Bro, yeah well they I actually, pioneered it for uh, us come on I, yeah well it's it's funny you say that because i heard you guys before i ever heard sworn in yeah, <laughs> yeah it's correct well and it's funny because mono is like it's heavy don't get me wrong but there's a lot of ambient nature to that album like kind of yeah, yeah, like yeah. the interludes and stuff like that so it's like ambient plus sworn in it's it's cool i know that um a lot of people seem to have kind of been like like kind of uh, like I like this song. I didn't like this one. I like this one, but I loved that album, and that's what really yeah. got me on to you guys. And then for me, from the outside looking in, to me it looked like you guys really started to like trend really upward with uh, with um, Black Mamba when that came out. Yeah. It was that was that is that pretty accurate or? Yeah, it was hard. Obviously, we took the six months off and ghosted all of our social media and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, because of actions around that time and whatnot and kind of tiptoeing around. And we got Lockie on board, who was originally meant to be our vocalist when we were looking for one. I remember you telling me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're like, all right, 
we got to come out swinging. So let's get the best guy who can do a sick video, who is a friend of ours called Ed. We could never afford him for the mono stuff, but we're like, whatever, let's just throw him all the money and get a sick video. Let's write a sick single. Mm. Um, and just go guns blazing as hard as we can. And we really love how much that song carried us and helped Lockie like become comfortable with us. And, you know, it's become one of our anthems along the live set, which is real fun. Yeah, no, man. I, I remember when that song came out, because obviously, you know, I, you know, being a follower of the band, I, you know, I, I knew what was going on back then. And then I saw you guys were coming back with, with new music and I was excited for it. And it, it was, it just, it, it hit that much harder than the stuff on mono. Like, yeah, I don't know yeah. what, it was just like that more primal, just aggression to it. And, uh, yeah, man. I, I, I want, so I want to get back to Loki, but by the way, I was calling him Loki forever. I mean, I don't know why, but I remember people, that people in the comments were like, his name is Loki. Like, like right now the pronunciation. And I'm like, I know, but I always say Loki. I know I can't help it. Um, so when I know that you released that single through Grayscale as well. Now, did you have like a, a deal with them that was one single left? Or did you just up with them for that single and to catapult? Nah, you to I think owner? everyone kind of didn't know the right steps to come back. So we were like, look, let's get lucky in. Um, and we'll just do a single. Like mm. it seemed like what we had to do to just introduce the new vocalist and we pitched our idea to Grayscale, like, look, here's the video, here's the song, here's the new promos, here's all the new merch designs, here's the new look, here's this and that and this and that and this and that. And they just basically, they couldn't say no. They, they couldn't say, oh, let's keep tiptoeing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't want any drama on Facebook and stuff like that. And we're like, look, we're going to come back at some time. Um, and I think it came down to a point we didn't know if it would work or not or if people are going to still shun us off facebook but we um announced a show at the same time a local show and we're like all right if we can't sell it out um like i think we lowered our capacity a little bit to what we were playing at the time mm -hmm. if we can't sell it out we've got a bit of work to do and we've got to build the brand back up but it sold out in like a day and we're like oh i think we're going to be all right I think everything's going to be all good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then instantly we're like, yep, sweet. And huge props to Lockie on Black Mamba because Aiden had his own version and that's the version that we had stuck in our heads. Mm -hmm. So trying to rewrite um, all the vocals, all the patterns and everything like that, we could not have input because the patterns were embedded in our heads from his demo. I got gotcha. And we're like, that, that's all we can think about. <laughs> so you just got to, here's the instrumental. We didn't show him Aiden's version and we just said, it's all you. Let's bring oh, it home. Cool. Let's, let's go. So he brought it in. And from that, once we got used to his version, we tweaked it and worked it in and it become what it is now. Cool. No, and, that's yeah, awesome. The versions are like complete opposites. Yeah. I was going to ask you, which, uh, you know, when you hear, when you hear Lockie's version, are you kind of like, oh man, I don't know. I kind of like that other version better. Were you like, all right. We can work with it. Let's tweak it. Yeah, honestly, to start off with, it was a bit like hard to adjust. <laughs> um, but then, like, I can't even remember the other version now because the new version becomes so much better. And yeah, it's just what it is. Yeah, no, man. I I uh, I remember that song coming out, and I was just like, "Damn, all right, okay." And then I, hey, I, I, I mean, I'm wearing the shirt. I mean, can yeah, I, can, yeah, I yeah. It's a, can I have a higher endorsement than that? But uh, so from there. Uh, I want to try to I want to backtrack a little bit because you said that Lockie was originally supposed to be the vocalist, but you said I remember you had said to me like through Facebook you had just said it was like bad timing because I know that he was in a band yeah, prior. Yeah. Uh, so did that have something to do with it, or what did you mean? But what yeah, you so um, yeah. we're always trying to improve ourselves as a band, and yeah. when John was our vocalist, our standalone vocalist, um, we'd always film ourselves and see the performance and stuff like that, and that was fine, but. Um, his vocals weren't like the strongest for a front man. Mm -hmm. And we're like, mm, maybe we got to do a little switcheroo. And me and John used to play in a band together where he played guitar. So he can obviously riff and stuff like that. Right. And he also plays bass. And we're like, look, man, maybe jump on bass. 
And Scotty, who's a riff maniac, was yeah. playing bass at the time. Where like he needs, kind of needs to be on guitar because he's a fucking riff lord. <laughs> and so we shuffled that around. We're like we were best friends with Lockie at the time. He used to come around do merch with us and fly to our home state and come to the shows there with us and stuff like that. Oh, cool. And he um, done vocals in a local band called Earthender, and they were like my favorite local band because their breakdowns were huge. Lockie was insane. Um, but they didn't really take themselves that serious. They're like, they were slackers behind the scenes. They didn't finish recording their EP. They barely toured or anything. We're like, Lucky needs to be in a hardworking band because he fucking kills it. Yeah. And we tried to full poach him from the band. We're like, dude, there's an opening. Come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, he come and had a jam with us. He wrote his own version of Nailbiter, but he never recorded it, unluckily. Um, but he come along and jammed that with us as we were writing it and stuff like that. And it was real fun. And then we put it to him we're like, dude, you want to, you want in, you want, you want a bit of this? And he's like, uh, nah, I might stick it out with my band and see how we're going. We're like, what? <laughs> dude, we, we literally like, <laughs> don't have a vocalist now for you and you're going to say no. Yeah. So it like, it put us in this position. We're like, all right, we've got to find someone. And we didn't have anyone in mind. We're like, we know that guy that comes to shows can kind of scream and there's that guy, but he fucking has face tattoos and won't really like blend well with us because he's like 10 years older than us. So the options got very limited and we ended up like choosing between two dudes that both done a, um, a version of Nailbiter. Mm. Like I'd sent them the instrumental, I sent them my lyrics for Nailbiter and I said, send it back to me. Um, Do what you got. Aiden tweaked it up a bit and added his own flair to it. And the other guy just done it stock standard and he done a big oh. And we're like, okay, we don't want oh's. <laughs> maybe, maybe we go with his version. And I think we kind of knew him. We kind of had mutual friends and stuff like that, but we didn't really know each other as well. Mm. But at that point, it was like, well, we kind of need a guy. Yeah, we and, need yeah. Someone, yeah. Yeah, because with John, uh, he was your vocalist uh, for that uh, that uh, legendary live video of you guys doing the Telly uh, cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his last ever show on vocals. Yeah, I, I remember. I think he told me that. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that cover, and I'm like, damn, this is. I was like, because I'm just a huge Amir fan, and. Uh, yeah. It was just cool to it was it's cool to see like uh, I guess I'm kind of kind of getting myself into that category of like these are my bands I try to reach out but it's like Alpha Wolf Amur it's just like I don't know why but that sound is just uh, is crazy but yeah so going back uh, to Black Mamba so from there uh, I know you had said that you you know because you you said you guys were kind of on a little bit of a hiatus for a little while um, when you came back and you sold out that room you kind of like, oh, shit, we could have came back a lot sooner, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, like, yeah, it's hard. We got bashed pretty hard online. And, like, us, us four that were, like, innocent, we're like, fuck, it kind of stings. You know, our family had to see that bullshit. Our friends had to see that bullshit. Hmm. And we just had to hide in the dark. You know, it was a pretty depressing time. We, we didn't know if we could post the status without 20 random people that we've never heard of bashing us because of some other dude's fucking wrongdoings Hmm. and we honestly didn't know if we could update the band status we had all this like tour stock that we printed but we couldn't post about online because like 20 people we haven't heard about or know about or whatever it's just kind of bash us for it we're like what are we gonna do yeah i i don't know man i i I don't know about you but i have a i have an issue with that kind of thing because it's like there's four of the guys in the band that are hardworking guys that are just trying to, I mean, you can't control every aspect of yeah, somebody else's I, life. I don't know. It, it's hard because sometimes there are complicit members that sure. know that True. bullshit's going on behind the scenes True. and they don't give a fuck. Yeah. And you, it, you don't really get the chance to speak up about your personal situation. Like, did you know what went on? Didn't you know? Are you going to lie about it? Rah, rah, rah. So everyone's just jumped the gun fuck you all and sometimes fair enough sometimes it's like you just yeah. just make sure you know who the fuck you're doing this shit with like yeah yeah, yeah i mean for, fortunately uh the, the guys in my band are, are, are a little bit older the other guy is the dad as well so i'm like man if these guys aren't uh Aren't, aren't aren't good boys i don't know who the hell is so we'll yeah, see what happens that. yeah <laughs> but 
So from Black Mamba, now, uh, well, what happens here now? So I know that you end up going to Sharp Tone for the fall EP. So what was that transition like? Did they, did they see Black Mamba and they were like, yo, all right, come I on. Think, I think Ash and Ash from Grayscale and Sean from Sharp Tone had like this relationship forming. So they'd talk to each other, whatever, whatever, whatever. And he pitched our EP to Sean and he liked it. And we're like, holy fuck. Sharp turn, a muir, a muir, sharp turn, like what the fuck? <laughs> so it was a no brainer for us. Um, we we're just like, yep, 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 sweet, 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 let's go. And it grew us phenomenally. Like Sub Zero dropping that yeah. blew up on Sharp Tone's YouTube channel. We're like, fucking hell. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember when that song came out, that was before uh, we were doing uh, the reaction channel and stuff like that. But I was just like, guys. Alf Wolf put out a new song. I'm going to wait to listen to it because obviously we go to my guitar player's house and he has like a home studio. I was like, we got to put these, I got to listen to this the right way. And I was just like, holy shit. And I remember like listening to the fall EP. We were actually coming back from a show. We were in the car and it came out at midnight and we were still driving back. We just listened to it from front to back. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not a fake fan. Okay. I just want to let you know. That's mad. That's mad. Yeah, I remember. I, I think I was in Prague when it came out, and I was paying way too much for internet because I was <laughs> roaming. And I was like, "Sweet, it's out." I think I'm sound checking. Um, I can't post about it because it'll cost me twenty dollars to fucking log onto the internet and <laughs> post something about it. The Wi-Fi here sucks. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, man. So you, yeah, so you guys must have obviously. I'm assuming you were on a tour at that time. Yeah, yeah, we we're touring with a Muir. Oh, that's right. That was um, uh, what tour was that? Was that uh, was that Empiricon or, or? Yeah, so we done the Empiricon first yeah. and like a big tour around Europe and UK with them. Oh, Rise, Rise of the North, the North Star. Star. That's Good right. For okay. King. I remember now. Okay, I remember now. Yeah, no, that was uh, that was a tight. It was that's one of those bills that you said like we look at and we're like, why the hell isn't that over here? You know. Like, oh, just- dude, I remember getting the offer. Um. I woke up and I had like 50 missed calls and a hundred messages and everyone's like trying to contact me to tell me that we got an offer with a mirror. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, next level. Okay. Like, obviously I'm like waking up, waking up, looking at my phone. And then it's like, I'm awake. All right, come on, let's go. Let's start the day. <laughs> it's on. Yeah. So it's okay. So uh, we could talk, let's talk a little bit about Amir because I, I ha- I think that you may be the only person that may rival me as, as a fan of that band, uh, you know, too, because yeah. Amir is a, a very, uh, I don't, I'm not controversial, but uh, what's the other word I'm looking for? Um, they're just one of those bands that they love them or you hate them. So yeah, wh- no, I feel that. yeah where does, uh, where does your fandom with them start? See, um, I think heaps of people were showing me Speaker of the Dead songs. Yeah. Um, and the arrogant part of me was like, nah, not into it. There's the dubstep in Solar Flare Homicide, and I was like, it's pretty whack, whatever. I don't know what I was listening to at the time, but there was an arrogant part of me that just didn't fuck with it. Mm. And then it slowly started to grow on me. I think Demons with Ryu and stuff um, had real mad mosh parts. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty sick. That's pretty sick. But they toured Australia with the Ghost Inside. They were supporting. Oh, wow. And uh, myself and John flew over to go see them because where we lived at the time never got shows. So we'd have to fly to Melbourne to go see them. <laughs> and they played this venue. And when they were playing, our jaws just dropped. They hit the floor and we were like, what? the fuck are we witnessing right now? Like Frankie Stees, the fucking drummer Stees, he had these fucking, he was using a floor tom for a rack tom. We're like, that's sick. Like fuck a rack tom when you get a floor tom. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Every, everything about the band in that era, we were just like, this is absolutely fucked. Yeah. This is sick. Yeah, it was back then. Who was the drummer back then? Do you remember? Was it uh, was it um, uh, Mark Castillo? Was yeah, that? yeah, him. Yeah, him. real built dude, and he's literally yeah. using floor tom, floor tom, and stick tricks, throwing sticks up in the air. Oh, I think it was dude. Mike on guitar with his fluoro orange Ibanez, and we're just like, I don't know everything in the band at that time hit me in a spot where I'm just like, yes, damn, yes. 
Yeah, no, because uh, that guy, Mark Castillo, he actually used to be in the rock band Crossfade. Are you familiar with that band at all? Not the Japanese band, no. No, no, that's cro- I think that's Crossfaith. But, uh, yeah, Crossfade, yeah, no, no, Crossfade, I never heard of them. Yeah, Crossfade is like that, like, you know, me in eighth grade listening to it back then, you know, just like, just like this is fucking, that's it, man, this is it. And uh, it's just so funny when I look back and I'm like, man, that guy was in that band? Because it's like mm. not anything. Like, I mean, it's like literally the furthest thing from a mirror. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's funny that you mentioned Speaker of the Dead because the first time I ever heard a mirror was Drug Dealer Friend. And I'm like, yeah. okay, I don't know if I can get into this band because I'm like, it starts off with, you know, the line. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll think I'll pass on this band for a while. And then I rediscover them later on and it's just, uh, it's crazy. Yeah, I don't, I, I started off this podcast with, with Frankie as the first guest because I was like, I got to start this off big. This is the guy right here. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, he, he's... There's just something about that band, man. I don't know. But, yeah, you being on Sharp Tone, uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, expect some more uh, Alpha Wolf and Muir stuff in the, uh, in the future. Yeah, that'd be so sick. Yeah. Anything, anything we can tee up will always be down for. Yeah. So, uh, I know. So, okay. So, Black Mama comes out. You have Fault that comes out. Now, is Fault kind of like, a, let's do an EP with Lockie to see – kind of how that go not 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 how it goes but like uh just to kind of build the brand back up before launching into another album cycle um so basically we had the skeleton of fault written um we were writing it as we were touring mono so that was like ready to go as well as black mamba when Lockie joined but Oh, we wow. kind of just rushed to get Black Mumbra out because EP takes a little bit longer. Mm. But we had written and recorded everything for Fault before we'd even announced like he's a member of the band. So he was still completely in the dark, in the shadows, wasn't announced or anything. And he's like hanging out with us, recording every single day and, you know, preparing ourselves to come back. And we kind of just were like, okay, Black Mamba, yep, ready to go, Fault, let's go. And we gave ourselves time for both of them. But, yeah, it was full. I think I can't remember how many photo shoots and video shoots we'd done prior to Lockie even being announced. We were just, let's backlog everything and just be a nonstop monster pretty much out of the yeah. gates. And, yeah, yeah it, it, I think looking back, it's pretty wild to know that I don't think Lockie had screamed in a band for like two or three years. And we're like, record all these songs for us. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Wow. Yeah, no. Well, he, he did a, he did a great job. I mean, he has like that really cool, just like, like hardcore, just yell, just style. And I, I think that's really, yeah. that's a really nice. Uh, he can do all the gutturals and all that sort of stuff as well. But anytime we try and place them, it doesn't feel right. He does, feel he does his free thing live. He goes nuts live, but on record, I don't think it's as listenable for us anyway. I know people love that shit, but for our songs, we love the mid range. Um, yeah. And yeah, it just suits our sort of style more to have a lot of mid range going on. Yeah, and I and I think I think that's good because I think a lot of times what happens is some bands will just be like, well, I'm just gonna do the biggest guttural I can wherever I can because it just sounds cool. And it's like, well, and that, that's a big just, turn off for me. I'll be like, next. Yeah, exactly. If, if I hear a vocalist just wanking themselves for the entire song and not giving a fuck about hooks, it's just a skip for me. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. And I and he does a great job too, just uh enunciating like in his cadence and stuff like that like you can really yeah. make like obviously people be like oh i can't understand they're screaming what are they saying but it's like you can kind of you can make out what he's saying for the most yeah part. i think that's super uh important as well but uh okay so you you have that and then a, a quiet place to die that's where we are now the in new baddie yeah so just in case somebody's watching this and you know the year 2030 at the time of this quiet place to die has been out for Jeez, man, what's it been out for now? Like six, eight months? Yeah, it's getting on. Yeah. Um, so when you release Fall, how far into that record are you, you know, writing-wise? Are you, are you pretty yeah. deep in? or? Um, I think Scotty had started some demos for A Quiet Place to Die, but Fault really just sent us around the world. So we were like, I think 
we played a hundred shows in 2019 and you know, there's 360 days in a year. So we're only home one third of the year, uh, two thirds of the year. But every time, every day we spent at home, we're writing, recording, doing whatever for a quiet place to die. But you know, in between all tours, it, it was nonstop. Um, I barely spent a second inside my own home because I was out prepping the new album and it was a crazy year and we were expecting obviously with 2020 to drop an album and just tour, 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 tour because we'd spent every second building towards that in 2019. But instead it's just like, there's no tours and we're just sitting on an album. Everything's prepped and ready to go, but we don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, w- when were you originally supposed to release that record? Because obviously, I'm assuming that it came out later with everything. Yeah, I think um, three months earlier it was meant to come out, like a okay. June release or something, yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah, no, because I, I, I remember you guys were actually in the States, and I actually wanted to ask you about your experience in the States, because have you been to the States before that tour, or is that your first I don't think any of us had been. None of you had been. Oh, wow. I think Mitch... Maybe Mitch has been there, or maybe yeah, Mitch. Interesting. What was? Uh, yeah, none of us had ever been there. Yeah, because you tore. I, I, if I remember correctly, you uh, had some uh, interesting places that you toured, and I was just like, huh. I wonder. I, I was like, I gotta ask him uh, what his impressions of the states were like. So, what was kind of the one thing that you were like, all right, yeah, that was the, that preconceived notion I had about the states is true. And what one were you like, all right, that's not that's not as bad, dude. We only saw a bum fuck like. <laughs> we flew into Detroit. I think our first show was cancelled due to a tornado, wherever that was. I can't remember. So we got to hang out in a car park for two days, waiting for the actual first show. That was in Springfield, and that was wild. Um, like, blew us away, and I think it blew away the whole tour package. So I was like, you sure you never been here before? Because that was fucking nuts. Yeah, And then we had another day off. So we spent another day in a car park randomly somewhere near fucking Springfield or fucking, I don't know, (laughs) a lot of car parks, a lot of doing nothings. And then we went to St. Louis Mm -hmm. and saw some guy whip out a gun in front of his friend for a joke. And we're like, fuck. Welcome to (laughs) Um, America, boys. That's what it felt like. I think we stayed at a fan's house and I slept in his dad's bed and I put my hand under his pillow and I thought he had some crystals or some bullshit like for meditating under his pillow. And I'm so tired. I've just passed out. His dad comes home the next day. He's like, oh, who slept in my bed? And I was like, might have been me. Oh, you didn't find my pistol. (laughs) And I was like, what the fuck? I'm sleeping on guns. Um, But that's all we saw. I got to see the St. Louis Arch that's on like Nelly's oh, album cover. Yeah, that's cool. I think we're like three days away from an Airbnb and a day off in New York. But it was like, go home now or you're never going home. We're like, all right. We got to see Detroit, St. Louis and um, Grand Rapids, wherever that is. Yeah, know. Michigan. No, nothing that- scenic, yeah. Yeah, nothing seen it now because it was funny because I remember you guys were going to come through. You, gonna, you guys were going to come to Rhode Island which is about two hours or so away from where I live. And I was like, I'm making that drive. But then we, we got booked a show that day, uh, but it never happened because of COVID, obviously. But we were going to play in the same town, actually. We were going to be in Rhode Island. And I was like, okay, we're not going to draw shit here, but whatever. But it was with Head P.E. of all bands. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, no, so I, I was uh, – I, I, I couldn't remember exactly your your touring routing, but I was like – I don't know if they ever got to like any like cool parts, you know, they're probably just like in the middle of nowhere. Absolutely. Middle of nowhere, man. Especially like, yeah, some of the random dates pulled out. So we're taking it as it goes, but there's as many days off as there were shows and we're only there for 10 days. Oh my God. They're just (sighs) waiting, sitting around wanting to find a shower and whatever. And we basically spent a week and went to the U S for a weekend. Yeah, so uh, explain to people just like how, I mean, because just getting from Australia to the States had to have been a, like just costly and a hassle. Oh, yeah. Well, like, like, the label pays for all that, but I don't think that's the case. See, the amount of paperwork for starters, like we got the working visas and so many bands, even bands bigger than us can still get rejected for working visas. 
I think make them suffer had just they did copped yeah, they that could, yeah. they couldn't do their tour. Um, so we were like well ahead of ourselves, making sure we could get the working visas. And I remember that involved an overnight drive to the American embassy, the Australian American embassy. Yeah, the American embassy in uh, Melbourne. Mm. We were on tour, but it's like, okay, your appointment's at seven a.m. Like, <laughs> oh, but we're here. The embassy's here. Okay, overnight drive it is. So just all this bullshit to make sure that we could get to the States, all the money, whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever. And then we obviously got shipped home. And I think even we still got off pretty lightly because, you know, we're just a support band. We didn't print $200,000 worth of merch. We didn't have $200,000 worth of production. We lost our flights and fucking it is what it is. But, yeah, it could have been worse. Um, And we, we just... Do what we can. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, though, man. If you come back to the States and another pandemic happens, I'm going to ask you to kindly never come here again. I just want to <laughs> let you know that. <laughs> Dude, we were in Wuhan like nine months before oh we went God. to you were You were in the breeding ground. Yeah. You, I remember you, us getting questioned um, at the embassy. They're like, have you been in China um, around these dates? We were there like a month before the cutoff. We're like, oh. No, not in that time frame. I've never Where been there, you? sir. I've never been there. <laughs> oh man, that's oh god, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I, uh, I, it's crazy, like how all I, I, it's just how all that stuff happened because I don't know, um, you know, from you being in Australia, uh, what was that like? Um, like as everything was kind of developing, it was like in January of that year. Was it kind of like, like yeah. eh, whatever, I'll, it'll be fine. It, it was weird. Obviously, we thought it was contained in China to start off with. So when we was applying for our visas and everything, we're like, yeah, how's this weird virus that's going on in China? We're talking to our Chinese um, tour promoter. Yeah. He was locked up in his house, not allowed to leave on full lockdown and stuff. And that was blowing our minds. We're like, dude, he can't even leave his house that's fucked up. But at the same time, we never thought it would happen to us. Yeah. And as time went on, I think when we were on the flight to the U S obviously that takes 20 hours, the toilet paper thing happened in Australia. Like all our partners were messaging us. Like I can't buy toilet paper. Um, I'm only allowed to buy two things of pasta and two things of fucking whatever. Oh, Everything's God. got limits on it. And we're like, what the fuck? Australia is going whack, but even then we're like, it's never going to affect our tour. No way. And as time went on, we're like, it's worldwide and we've got to go home and we've got to get locked in our house. And we're exactly like China now. We can't leave our fucking house. But it seems like Australia is kind of on the upswing at this point, though, right? From what I, I was yeah, talking to Mikey from Gloom in the Corner. And he would, that's what we he- had our fucking six month lockdown where it was hard. It was, kind of bullshit we weren't allowed to leave our house after 8 p.m and we weren't allowed to have visitors only one person in the household could go grocery shopping so there's all these rules set in place and you could only go outside for an hour every day to exercise and all these rules are in place and we just had to abide by them for six months and that obviously turned us into one of the best countries in the world for this pandemic right now and there was a gig in Melbourne tonight where people were moshing. Like it wasn't a sit down show. It was really, yeah. Like I'm looking at people's stories on my Instagram and it's full blown pits. And I'm like, Holy fuck. Melbourne did it. It's happening. There's death course shows. On. That that's crazy. It's it's, I wonder how long it'll take for all of us to kind of look at like the stories of like people moshing and be like, Whoa, what are they doing? I can't believe they're moshing. And it's like, it's going to take us like years to finally be like, all right, this is like a thing we, we can do this again. Yeah, but, like there, there was a time where I was like, it's never coming back. But Perth in Australia, they're pretty isolated. It's a three-hour flight to get there and no one kind of goes there. They were having full EDM doof doof festivals, like 30,000 people. I'm like, all right, it can come back. If yeah. Perth can have a 30,000 like doof doof festival, all we got to do is just lock down. We'll be sweet. Yeah, and unfortunately, you guys are an isolated country, so it makes it a little bit easier I would think. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's crazy though. An hour outside. I mean, that's like literally U S prison. Like that's what the prisoners can do. They go outside. I got, I got obsessed with Pokemon go (laughs) and to get to the local Pokemon stop, I had to like go to the local park, which is 10 minutes down the road. 
And I was trying to spin it every day consecutively for seven days. And I mm-hmm. missed it once. And I looked at my phone. It was 10 past 8 p.m. You know, that's past the cutoff date. Oh. Uh, cut off time to leave the house so you get fined or whatever i'm like oh, no way so i literally like put on all my jogging gear and i was like i sprint there i sprint back i'll be two minutes max i need to spin that poker stop and i don't think i've ever had so much adrenaline in my life oh my god that's I felt like funny. the biggest criminal leaving my house at quarter past eight <laughs> It, that, oh, dude, I got a funny Pokemon Go story for you. So when it first, when did that first come out? Was that 2015, 20? What? I think it was 2016. 2016. It, was, it was winter our time. And I remember freezing my fucking ass off going outside every night. Because it, yeah. it, it was like zero degrees. And I'm like, this is bullshit. Yeah. it's So that over, at least where I live, was the epitome of a fad. Like, I mean, it was literally like a week. And then it was like everybody like kind of stopped. But I remember for that first week, though, or the town that I live in, um, I was, I had a friend of mine and we went out and we, we played here and there and my son was little at the time. So like, he was obviously into it. He thought it was fun, but one of the gyms was the police station. <laughs> so I don't, you just, I don't know how that happened, but that's how it happened. And so like, you know, we would go kind of around there. And I remember my friend and I at like two in the morning, we were like, kind of like driving it, from the outside looking in it probably looks super sketchy. Just like going through like a, a Walmart parking lot, just like super slow looking for Pidgeotos or whatever, you know, and a cop pulls up to us like, so, uh, so what are you doing? And we're like, honestly, we're playing Pokemon go. And they were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and they thought that was like the weirdest thing. And I told them, I was like, by the way, I want to let you know that your police station is a gym. So if you see some characters walking around on your premises, just know that's why. So that was super funny. Uh, that's my Pokemon Go story. What a wild time. I remember just the craziness that occurred with the launch of that. Yeah, it's it's a cool, it's a, it's like super cool. It's like a cool uh, like way for, especially for kids, because, uh, you know, a lot of kids nowadays, you know, they want to play Fortnite and stuff and be inside, but now Pokemon Go gets them outside at least, and it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it seems yeah. like a fun thing. And I saw that you've been doing some... Uh, unboxings on twitch for that kind of stuff and uh, i'm hooked on pokemon cards like bringing that nostalgia it's sick yeah no it is because there's a there's a a card shop right here in my town that's been around forever and they they sell like singles and stuff like that and uh we my son is really into pokemon cards and we go there and there's like a first edition blastoise it's like 400 bucks yeah it's it's just like cool to like see that stuff and it's uh very very nostalgic as you said but i know it's getting late for you so i'll wrap this up here quickly for you but uh so i just want to quickly touch on a quiet place to die obviously it gets delayed but that really catapulted you guys at least from somebody who's been following you guys for a long long time that record took you from like like tenfold it it, it seemed like yeah it was like obviously we toured so much off of fault so we quickly found our strengths within yeah. our band were like um little things like there were slow breakdowns on mono that we thought were cool at the time and drop tune stuff but playing that live was the biggest drag people <laughs> stop moshing after like two seconds and then you're playing this slow breakdown for another fucking minute and you look like a fucking dweeb doing it because <laughs> no one gives a fuck so we're like okay no more of that all the energetic breakdowns are sick where we can fucking spin around and do some cool shit on stage. Everyone loves that. So things like that and all the vocal hooks are like they're sick live. Um, we, yeah, we definitely just found what works for us as a band and use that to our advantage because we produce ourselves and yeah, we know what we're going to end up liking or not. And that entire album like, I feel like it's going to be insane live and we don't know how to pick a set list. Like if we, play a festival slot or some crap and can only play five songs. We got no fucking idea what songs to pick because we're so eager to play every single song live. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, no, it's, uh, man, it it, it was just such a, um, you're right though. I mean, it definitely had, um, that more just like, instead of like the breakdowns being super slow, everything was just, it almost like it seemed like it sped up. And like, because I know for me as a a listener, I'm like, especially when I listen to some slam worldwide stuff and it's just dun, dun, 
end it. I'm just like, oh my god, can we get can we get this over with? Can we move on to the next part, please? But yeah. you guys keep the energy going, and I thought that that uh, that kind of just sonic nature, I think, um, I think a lot of people just gravitated towards that, and was just super aggressive, and just everything going on in the world. I think that that really also kind of in a way uh oh it did definitely consciously helped it yeah and it's like writing that album i think one thing we've always tried to do as well is not write the same song twice yeah. so we'll, we'll we'll stand back and look at everything from an outside perspective We're like, okay we need every single bpm to be vastly different there's nothing worse than listening through an album and they've found the one sound or the one BPM that works for them and write 10 songs exactly the same because you get confused so quick yeah. about what song is what. Whereas we're like, you know, we've got the super fast one that starts with a blast. We've got the soft one that starts with fucking slow ass clean guitar almost. You got the fucking real boppy one with the whammy. You've got the fucking whatever. And within the first two seconds of every song, you know exactly what song you're in for. Mm. And me listening to old, say red hot chili peppers that's what inspired that you put on two seconds of a song and it could be the super funky one it could be the super emo one it could be the fucking rock one and you want that you want an album to be a journey and that's what we've come up with for ourselves it's still were heavy records like front to back but we've found our different methods of heavy i guess i got yeah no that that's true and uh I actually, uh, so I did a full album, like reaction review to it um, for our, for our patrons. That's what I do over there is that stuff. And I, uh, I remember getting to don't ask at the, at the very end. And I mean, listen, man, I, I don't know about you, but I've always kind of found with a lot of albums, people are like the, the last tracks almost like not a, th I don't want to say throwaway track. Cause that's too harsh, but it's, it's not like a, yeah, this song's sick. Like I can't wait yeah, to listen yeah, to yeah. this track all the time. But that one was like a, just like a super, I don't know, man. It was like melancholic, but it was just like a super awesome way to wrap up what was overall just like a really heavy album. I mean, I know you had, um, um, and I can't think of it. Look at this. My, my fake fandom's coming out. What the hell's the name of that song? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the slow song that you have bleed for you. Okay. Yeah. Jesus yeah. Yeah. Christ. Um, yeah. So it was just, it was just cool for you guys to wrap up the album that way. But um, yeah, man, I don't know. So I know that you do a lot of the graphics and a lot of like the, the, the theme and imagery for you guys as well. And I know that you kind of go with like that anime stuff. And if anybody who's watching the video version of this, uh, you'd be able to see that, you know, Sabian you may be a fan of, maybe a fan of anime. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but it looks like he is. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, I think that aesthetic and I don't know, man, that orange or something about that orange that was just super alluring. Yeah. We obviously like to mix it up and yeah. the orange just, it came to us by the fucking artist that done the artwork and we're like, all right, we're orange now. Guess that's cool. Let's go with that. Um, I love blue. I fucking blue is my favorite color. So I get to yeah. fuck with blue for a whole year with fault. But now I've taken on board with orange. I'm like, sweet orange, purple goes with orange and black goes with orange. Let's go. Lots of stuff goes with orange. There's my cat in the background there. <laughs> I know that you're a cat guy as well, which by the way, yeah. I, I showed my girlfriend that picture that you posted of your cats with the, uh, little, little scarfs on and stuff like that. <laughs> I thought that, that dude, those, those are some, those are some good looking cats. I'm just going to yeah. be honest as a, as a cat guy myself. Uh, I got to be my gotta, sons. Yeah. Oh, they're all boys. Okay. That's yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. But no, so that artwork though, I had one of those, like I was that many days old when I realized what the artwork actually was. I never, I, I thought it was like a, like a Phoenix or something like that, but then I looked yeah, at it, yeah, oh, yeah. there's a guy, there's a guy's head there. Okay. Yeah. But, that's uh, the, that's the original right there. The artist ended up giving it to me. I didn't expect him to, but oh, he gave cool. me the original print, which is real cool. But um, he's like, a. have been friends with that dude for like it's, insane art. it's insane artwork i mean it's yeah, like yeah. super detailed it's not like adobe stock images throw it yeah. on and you know mess that's what up. we wanted you know we get sick of all these reused um artworks within our little metalcore genre so like whatever let's go to a fucking graffiti artist that only does hip-hop yeah and see what he does like i've loved his artwork for as long as i can remember he's an insane graffiti artist um and he's always been kind of out of our price range because he's insane. Yeah. And I gave him one small idea. I was like, I want a dude hunched over 
in like some angst, like he's fucking having a real fucking bad time. <laughs> and that's all I gave him. I was like, you draw sick butterflies, so let's put them in there. Maybe some wings because wings are fucking sick. And you just go for you. So we ended up like using mixed media. He hadn't done that before. So there's watercolors, there's pens, there's pencils, there's Jeez. fucking, I don't know. He's used everything in the one piece. And, you know, it was a big leap of faith for us. I, I asked my dudes if they mind me reaching out to this guy for artwork. And they're like, yeah, I guess so. We've got no ideas ourselves. And I mean, we just loved it in the end. Yeah, no, it is awesome. Yeah, no, I definitely had, was ignorant to the whole Adobe stock image thing. And I remember we had one of our singles has like uh, has the artwork. And I was uh, I was looking through Instagram and I saw somebody like just made a post and used like the same imagery. And I was like, what the fuck? Like I was like, <laughs> that's the same thing. And so I was like, ask. I'm like, how? I'm like, well, I'm like, I don't think the guy stole it from us. And somebody's yeah, like, oh, yeah, Adobe yeah. stock images. And I'm like, oh, well, we're never fucking doing that again. Not never again. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's, um, that's really, that's funny. But um, so the other things that I just wanted to bring up quickly uh, was um, the restricted music video. That one, I think uh, was, I mean, just uh super cinematic, man. Uh, I, I just, uh, I mean, wow. I mean, it was, yeah, that was yeah, a crazy yeah, yeah. music. What was, what was like, what was that like putting that together? I know that's a kind of a broad question, but that, I mean, that was like, you know, Akadama was a cool music video just because of all the edits and stuff like that. But like that one was like super like cinematic. Yeah. I think, um, so we obviously knew Akadama was going to be the leading single and we just wanted some crazy visuals for that. Yeah. And, you know, we obviously got that, <laughs> but with restricted, um, we used our friend Ed again, who shot black Mamba. Mm -hmm. Like he's a very good friend of ours and an amazing cinematographer. He's literally going to be shooting your favorite movies in the years to come. I swear to God. Oh my God. And we showed him our next four choices for singles. Yeah. We had made up our minds up because we love every song. And we're like, pick your favorite. Here's all the lyrics and pick what comes to you, um, which one you can see a vision for. And we'll go with that. You know, here's our money. Let's make something phenomenal. And he chose restricted and he pitched us the idea. And we're like, whoa. Um, all right. Let's, let's fucking do it. Um, I mean, fuck tippy towing let's let's just go in and yeah. the lyrics of that like obvious aggression against that topic of um like sexual assault and all that bullshit and why why tiptoe around the visuals like let's just go in and do this shit and some like we were there on set and some scenes were like hard to be there for and yeah. just the overall outcome is this incredible video that some people can only watch once some people can't watch at all and that's totally fine we get that but it's definitely like hit a spot in a lot of people i know that for sure yeah it was definitely one of those music videos because uh you know we did a, a reaction to it i just remember the ending and then obviously we know how it ends and it's just like oh shit like it was just like yeah. it was just like it was almost like it was one of those moments where and it's no disrespect to the song because now listening to the song back, it's like this song's awesome. But it's like in the moment, it's like the music is like secondary at this point. Like I'm yeah, just focused yeah. on how this is unfolding on the music video. Um, but yeah, man, no, I, I I'm super like uh, stoked for you guys. It's like it's, like, it's kind of one of those things where it's like I've been a fan for so long. It's just like I fucking told you guys <laughs> this band. I told you, you know, and. Uh, no nah, man, I'm stoked for you guys, and it's it's through guy it's through bands like you where I discovered Lance, and now Lance is kind of he's been mixing our songs and uh, fuck yeah, Lance. What, what's what's he like in uh, in real life? Before I get you out of here, dude, he's one of the most down to earth and genuine people I've ever met in my life. So if we write a riff that he thinks sucks, he will tell us. He won't be like, oh yeah, that's cool, and then go to some other guy and tell them that we're writing shit riffs he would just yeah. say it's a fucking shit riff right and yeah we've been mates for a fair while now ever since i moved to melbourne and he's just one of those guys that is super genuine yeah like and he's not out to fucking be a 
follow a trend. He's not out to fucking be cool or anything like that. He's just Lance. Grew up on a farm. He's just the dude, and he's really good at mixing records and mixing live sound. Yeah, because I know he's been on some podcasts recently, and I listened to those, and it's just uh, his the way that he broke into doing everything is super cool. And uh, man, that dude's mixes are just fucking yeah. I, I don't it, know what it's it is. It's wild. But... I'd love to hear us with the polished American sound almost, but I'm really happy with how we sound. You know, it's it's pretty organic with the organic drums. But there's like no samples with those and stuff like that, and it's just these pumping guitars and. It sounds fat. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, I, well, I mean, we go to him because I'm like, man, I want to sound huge, you know, because sometimes yeah. I'm like, I want this, like when I turn, when I turn a song up, I want to be like my face, like going back like this. And, and he, he accomplishes that, but nah, man, he, uh, it's funny, um, you know, through the songs that we've sent him to mix uh, for our last one that we just released, he, he's never really said anything. Cause I know it's really, you know, he's not producing or anything. He's just kind of mixing it, but he sent back the last one. He's like, I really like the chorus in this song. And I was just like, <laughs> I was like, Oh my God, that's like the dad after 50 years. Aww. He's like, I'm proud of your son. And I'm just like, wow, Lance, <laughs> like the <Fuck> chorus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but listen, man, I know it's getting late for you. That's the one problem with you guys over there in Australia is that I want to, I, I, I tend to talk and talk and talk. If you haven't figured that out, you're probably half an hour. And it's like, Oh my God, <laughs> this guy ain't going to shut up. Is he? No, we're sweet. But, we're sweet. Yeah. But maybe we'll get a part two in. Eventually, you know, I would, uh, I'd like to, uh, continue talking to you about a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I would like to talk to you about, but I know it's late for you over there. What is it now? Yeah. It's almost, it's a uh, two 30 AM. That's right. Yeah. So we'll do a Pokemon card podcast. Oh my God. I'd love that. I'd love, I'd love <laughs> to do that. But listen, Sabia, man, I know that a lot of people are going to be hyped about this one because you don't do too many interviews. It seems like you do, but they're always kind of shorter. And, uh, I, I, I corralled you. Yeah, they're always yeah. blocked in the little segments we get yeah so I, I corralled you for a little bit of a longer one here and hopefully i'll get you back again but listen man uh it's been a pleasure getting to meet you uh through facebook and now uh, it's been awesome uh, being able to talk to you uh over the zoom here likewise man all right well save you thanks so much man and guys i mean listen i mean i let, let I know that you're watching this. You know who Sabian is. You know who Alpha Wolf is. But in case you're one of those random people just stumbling across this, if you haven't listened to A Quiet Place to Die, you're an imbecile. Uh, on that note, Sabian Lynch, Alpha Wolf, thank you, man. Get it, get it. Cheers, man. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the True Shot Guest Life. Listen to this on Spotify. Share it with a friend. Share it on social media. Tag us. Tag uh, Sabian over there. Tag Alpha Wolf. Tag somebody. Listen to this on Apple Podcasts. Do the same, but also leave us a review, a five-star review, hopefully. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share it, all that good stuff. We really, really appreciate you. And if you want to, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash trueshotofficial. And until the next episode, goodbye.